video. So I'm hitting record. I just want to make everybody aware of that. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We don't have much of that. But um, as I said, if you want to rename yourself just to tell us which local league you're with or what town you represent, it's just kind of cool because um, we have all parts of North Carolina uh, on this Zoom. And you can do that by, I'll put instructions in the chat, um, but you can cursor over your face on the video, click the three dots that you see when you cursor over your own face on your video, and the three dots will take you to rename, and then you can type in something different than what it says right now. Um, this is an informational session mostly, so there's not going to be a ton of back and forth Q&A, but if you do have a question, of course, feel free to put it in the chat um, and, you know, have a conversation in the chat as you would like, and we'll try to get to questions, but, the, you know, it kind of becomes, can we answer the questions because we are not law enforcement, we are just having an informational session on research we've done on that topic. Um, so I just wanted to say that. I always like to see a lively chat. Um, I have everybody on mute and we'll, we'll keep everybody on mute during the presentation. Um, as I said, we are recording this and we're so glad you're here. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Martha Robley uh, of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina State Board. Take it away. Thank you, Andrea. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first of a five-part program examining the interaction of communities with their local law enforcement, titled Our Community, Our Police. I am Martha Robley. I'm the unit coordinator for the Mid Sand Hills Member at Large Unit of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina. And I'm also co-chair of the League of Women Voters of North Carolina Policing Practices Working Group. Joining me this evening is Sandra Mal. She's a member of the League of Women Voters of Henderson County, and she co-chairs the working group with me, and also Ernie Mal, who's a member of the League of Women Voters of Henderson County. The Policing Practices Working Group is made up of members of local leads all across the state. In May, the League of Women Voters joined the world in mourning the death of George Floyd and the countless other black lives lost as a result of the continuing injustice and racial inequities in our criminal justice system. The League is an organization whose mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. We stand in solidarity with all black communities and the many organizations that have been actively working to achieve racial justice and justice, excuse me, and policing reforms. We acknowledge this is a widespread issue. It's not just confined to Minnesota or Missouri. For example, as recently as June of 2020, three police officers were fired from the Wilmington Police Department after recordings of their inappropriate and hate-filled speech towards the black citizens they were sworn to protect and the disrespect for their boss, a black police chief, were discovered. The League is governed by principles that include the belief that no person should suffer legal discrimination and that the government should be responsive to the will of the people. We also believe a democratic government depends upon the informed and active participation of its citizens. But in order for the League of Women Voters to take action on a public policy issue, such as policing practices, there must be League membership understanding and agreement, which we usually do through a consensus or concurrence method. We formed this working group when we realized there was no public policy position at either the national or the North Carolina level that specifically addresses policing practices. The result is that in our capacity as League members, we're not then able to weigh in on any legislative solutions that specifically address this issue. But as I say, as all good leaguers do, the first step is to educate ourselves and the public. Thus, the first four programs of the five are designed to provide our members and the public factual information that can be used as a basis for understanding the issue of policing practices. This first one will provide a general overview of community policing, and then will be followed by hiring standards and practices, training, and finally oversight. The fifth and last program is designed for league members to discuss the possibility of doing a consensus study or concurrence to bring before the member delegates of the 2021 League of Women Voter North Carolina Convention. 
With that, let's get to tonight's program. Our community, our police, what you know, what you don't know, what you want to know. I'll now turn it over to Sandra Mal. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. And our first question is, um, our, we have some poll questions tonight to interact with you. And our first poll question tonight, Andrea is gonna put up about that. And our first question is, just so we can see who's in the audience, um, you know, are you, a, are you currently a league member? And to answer that, hopefully you can say yes and submit your answers and we'll take a look at the results. We have about 84% of our participants here tonight are members and 16% are not. So we just want to, we want to make sure we tend to fall into league speak sometimes. Um, so we just want to see who was out there and so that we know we can go into a little more detail on league procedure and policy sometimes when we when we start to say things that we think everybody understands and if you're not a member we'll try you know we'll try to clue you in on that so um next slide please so uh martha talked a little bit about our principles um i, I wanted to reiterate what she kind of what she's talking about that and to say there are a lot of organizations and a lot of groups uh, that are looking at policing issues right now and they have a wide range of focus and they're looking at use of force, they're looking at funding, and they're looking at all kinds of issues. And the Policing Practices Working Group is focusing on the intersection of the community and the police for these educational programs, and more specifically, the need for citizen input into the community impact of policing policies and the need for more citizen oversight. Next slide, please. And so, um, one, one of our other guiding principles uh, is a belief that democratic government depends upon the informed and active participation of its citizens. So we began our fact finding by asking ourselves and asking you some questions. And quite frankly, we didn't, we didn't know the answers to these questions, but we prepared to dig in and, and look into to the answers. Sandra, so, yeah. say your audio is kind of breaking up. I just want to make sure there's nothing like um, rattling around. I, I just didn't know it was good for a while and then it was really bad. It's just kind of breaking up. I didn't know if there's anything I'm, rattling around your speaker. Paper. Uh, not that I am aware of. It's good now. So it, okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, maybe maybe it's my clipboard. On I don't know with my notes. Uh, I'll I'll try and be aware of that. Um, so. Next slide, please. So, of the people who registered for this program, 44 people took the survey by the 17th. I had to compile the, um, the answer, so that was the cutoff for me. And um, we looked at about 40 departments, and we, we looked at those based on first um, the places where we have leagues, active leagues. And second, based on the zip codes of the areas represented by the people who answered the survey. So, um, like I said, we have 100 counties. We couldn't possibly look at all of them. So that's who we decided to focus on for this program. Next slide, please. So next poll question, just curious, um, because we did ask you to take the survey without looking up answers, just to see what you knew off the top of your head. So we have another question just to see did you, after you took the survey, did you maybe look into some of those areas? And I think the first poll closed too fast for people. So I just want to be mindful of that. Um, I'm going to launch this one now. Okay. Uh, and I'm looking to see if I can, uh, we just want to, let's try to prolong it, but also let's try to, um, if y'all are ready, I'm hitting the launch button. Go for it. So like I said, we were just, we were just curious because I know there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of questions. I, like I said, we didn't know the answers either. We just thought these were things we uh, might look into, and we wondered if any of you thought about looking into that. Okay, so that's just a curiosity thing for me. Uh, so yes, seven percent did look into it. Ninety-three percent did not. That's that's cool because, then, um, like I say, we we did look, and uh, and we're going to help you out here with the answers. So um, no worries. Okay, so. Next. So slide. sorry. So we got. I guess I'll close the poll now. We've got um, 47 out of 59 of you. Do you want me to show these poll results? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. I'll share those. Oh, cool. So a few people did, and that's. I was like, that's cool. So um, next slide, please. And you can take the poll down. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, okay. So this was one of the first questions we asked. 
uh, what, local, look, what local agency covers you. And you can see by the numbers that um, some of you are covered by more than one agency. So um, I, I know we got somebody listening maybe who doesn't have audio or doesn't have video. So, uh, and I can't quite see that all of this because people are under here. Do you see? Almost, but it's over 25 <clears throat> said city police department. And it looks like about 23 said county sheriff's department and one said other. Which I, I wasn't even sure when I put that in as an answer. Is there something other than the city department or a county department that covers you? But it turns out um, the person who answered that question other based on their zip code, we found that they were in Jackson Springs and Jackson Springs does not have its own police department. It has a agreement with a neighboring police department, Oxfire Village. So I thought that was an interesting thing to find out. And we also found as we delve into this information that the, the more we, the more questions we looked at, the more answers we found, the more questions we had. Next slide, please. So we wondered about how the city and the county departments work together. And the answer likely depends on where you are. Your county and city departments might have a great relationship. And then again, there might be some animosity between them or something in between those two extremes. And we also wondered, if you live in a city, uh, is it always going to be the city police department who shows up if you call 911 or will the county sheriff sometimes show up? I, I think the 911 system is a subject for a whole other program, uh, but it helps us illustrate why we're not jumping into a lot of complicated issues before we know the basic facts about how things are supposed to be working. And uh, this is also a good point, place to point out um, that we'll be talking a lot about how law enforcement is supposed to work in principle in this state. And if we decide to pursue a statewide study or your league should decide to pursue a local study, uh, what we'll be doing then is looking at how the actual practice stacks up against the principle of these departments publicly endorsed. Next slide, please. All right, so I need, all right, thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Ernie Mal, and I'm the lead one of the voters in Harrison County. And so the question for those who don't have uh, videos, how do these departments communicate with you? Well, we gave a lot of different options, web pages, uh, it looks like between five and 10 Facebook page that uh, almost 10 people, Twitter feed, a few website, um, a few regular precinct meetings, a few, the biggest number, we, we saw a lot of variety in answers, but the biggest answer we get is, I don't know. And that makes sense at this stage. We don't know. We're trying to find out what's going on. And we probably are not communicating with our local law enforcement right now, either receiving information from them or sharing our take on things. So it asks a couple of questions. How willing are we just to call up our local police and chat? And how welcoming are they to our asking questions? And to me, this is the most basic intersection of police and community, just talking. Um, as individuals, we usually don't talk to law enforcement officers unless there's an issue, unless we're having a problem. It works the same way. Most law enforcement agencies and officers are not talking to individual members of the public unless there's a problem. And while this is important, this um, interacting back and forth only when we're in some type of crisis, it skews first impressions and it doesn't make for open communication. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. All right, sorry. So one of the most basic forms of communication for any kind of agency, and, and we saw it for sheriffs and police departments, are active websites. Many are dedicated sites, but some smaller agencies are going to have a single web page embedded somewhere in their city or their county's website. And while almost all, I, I would say virtually all of the websites have some type of contact information, that's usually going to be at least an administrative telephone number or an email. Um, some have full personnel directories. Uh, you can reach their top leadership by email or by phone. Uh, you can email some agencies have where you can email individual officers that you've interacted with. Um, often they have a frequently asked questions section. 
And that'll direct you to some of your more commonly used services or questions such as uh, applying for gun permits, fingerprinting, requesting inmate information, crime prevention tips, neighborhood watch, and more. So a small number of websites had links to other county um, state, even nonprofit groups, or other related type services. Next slide, please. Okay, so Facebook being as popular as it is, it's no surprise that law enforcement agencies are using Facebook. Just about every one of them had a Facebook page. What was interesting was the wide range of uses that they found for Facebook. Some agencies use Facebook to ask for assistance from the public, be it uh, identifying people or vehicles from surveillance photos, uh, or looking for wanted people, uh, putting up wanted posters on Facebook, um, seeking information or showing information about a successful or newsworthy arrest that they had made recently. A um, couple of examples, the Durham Police Department seems to show a large number of uh, mugshots. The Hendersonville Police Department uses Facebook to post their monthly statistics report. Raleigh Police Department recently referenced posts from a private citizen's Facebook account where an arrest had been made and it was videoed and posted on their website. And um, so it's gonna be interesting to see how that, that goes. Well, almost every agency used their Facebook page as a public relations tool. And they're showing off school visits, good deeds, um, animal-related stories, promotions, retirements, pictures of training, and other feel-good type stories. Next, please. So since I mentioned training, we would like to invite you to the third session of our series, on October 15th, and it will focus on police training in North Carolina. And during that, uh, during that presentation, we're going to talk about the basic law enforcement training program, which every North Carolina officer is mandated to go through. Uh, then the field training phase that follows your initial training, if you're an officer, and then the annual in-service training, which is required to maintain an officer's certification. And that's on October 15th, and we look forward to seeing you there. But back to social media. Next slide. Twitter. Um, a lot of agencies had Twitter, probably most of them. And while those agencies that have a Twitter account were also using it for public relations, similar to Facebook, we found a lot more uh, tweets that had time sensitive notifications such as traffic updates, weather alerts, construction notices, or notices of police operations, um, stuff that the agencies were trying to get out in a very timely manner, far more so than on the websites or Facebook. Next, please. What did interest me when we were doing this research, and I had no idea, was that a dozen of the agencies we looked at have a YouTube channel. Uh, and a lot of those have public service announcements and recruiting videos, uh, a lot of very, very interesting. We found 10 Instagram accounts, just chock full of pictures, a Flickr page, and even a Yelp page. And what was interesting about the Yelp page, you can see from the uh, screenshot, when I took the screenshot, there were 10 reviews there. Most of those reviews are about people's experiences going in to get their gun permits or going in to get their fingerprints for another agency. And most of the reviews are very nice and there's always that one that it's like, that was the worst experience they ever had in their entire life, you know, kind of, kind of review. So, but it's kind of interesting that they have a, have a review page for their services. That, that's how you know it's a Yelp page. You always have that. All right, next slide, please. All right, well, that takes us into a question. So, um, can you try- Actually, let me back up there. I, I, yeah. Sorry, we're still having audio problems. I'm wondering if you turn off your video, if it would be better. It's just, it's okay. just really, and it, it sometimes it's good, but it, it's mostly kind of broken up some. I am so sorry. Let's see if that, see if that helps any. Will that help? Does that, that help? That's sounding good now. So we'll okay. keep that going. Sorry to not see you. Oh, well, that's no, right. it's, it's okay with us. <laughs> okay, Andrew, so before you start the poll, I'm sorry, I, I jumped the gun, I skipped. I just wanted to say that while most of these forms of social media that we looked at were active and current, we did find a few 
that had not been updated in months. Um, and just from a kind of a statistical note, the number of followers for all these accounts kind of roughly compared and correlated with whatever the size of the community was. And just as a personal note, I didn't see any significant difference between uh, the type of activity that you would find on a police department versus a sheriff's office website. But I am interested to see if that changes during election season. And I apologize, I, we're ready for the next poll question. Okay, here comes the poll. All right, so do you regularly monitor or interact with your law enforcement agencies in one of the more ways that we've talked about? The results are coming in. Yeah, y'all are quick on the draw here. Good. Okay, we're at 47. Give it a couple more seconds. Can we get to 85%? <laughs> Okay, that's good. End, ending the poll and sharing results. All right, so we're seeing a trend here. 12% uh, of us said, yes, we have interacted, and a whopping 88% said, no, we haven't. So based on that and what we've talked about, the main point we'd like you to take away is we want to encourage everyone who's with us tonight. If you're not already tuned into your local law enforcement social media, we think it would be a great idea to start monitoring and, when appropriate, responding to the communications coming from your law enforcement agencies. Again, it's communicating, them talking to us, and us talking to them. And speaking of us, communicating with our local agencies. Next slide, please. I'm pushing it. Again, I'm having, sorry, we're having technical. There we go. Yes. Okay, so for a non-emergency call, how do you contact your local department? And um, so we're looking to see, so a lot of people on the survey answered that administrative phone number is readily available and that's great to see uh, because if you have to call, going to the website is usually a, an excellent idea. Um, but again, we have a significant, significant number of people who say, I've never done that. And again, it's not surprising. So for non-emergency situations, this is for like when we have questions like, why do I never see officers on foot patrol when I'm downtown? Or can deputies check on property when I'm away for an extended period? That's a good time to be using that administrative phone number. Um, it's also a question you have to ask yourself, and we, we talked about it briefly before, do you feel comfortable calling up and having a conversation with an officer? And when you do, do your local officers have time to talk with you and do they seem to take your concerns seriously? So just calling and talking with officers of your local law enforcement is also a way that our local leagues can set up an in-person meeting once we start having face-to-face -face meetings again uh, with your sheriff, your police chief, or we can call them to invite them to a virtual meeting. Opening communications can strengthen the relationship between community and law enforcement prior to and outside of a crisis situation. You don't wanna wait till there's a crisis to start trying to understand each other. And I personally say it's also a great opportunity to introduce yourself to elected and appointed officials, let them know who the league is and what our mission is. Next slide, please. Let me try it here. Okay, I'm pushing it. Sorry. Is the is the is the speak is the speaker any better? Is the is it we're doing okay. You're doing great. We, we everyone's in the chat saying we appreciate all this research. It's not perfect, but you know what is. All right. <laughs> I yeah, I don't know. All, all right. right. We we need a home studio now. <laughs> so when we're asking about how often you get media related stories or information, we're looking at traditional media radio, television, newspapers. Um, and from the answers that we have, uh, so one of our options was, do we see stories more than once a week? Or mm, that was oh, a little over 10, more than once a month was a little over 20. Five people said never. And uh, about six people said, I don't know. So how about these stories? How do, how do law enforcement agencies get stories into the traditional media? 
one piece of information that we were looking for in the law enforcement websites was, is there a public information officer? And public information officers, or PIOs, you'll hear me say, they typically interact with the media through press releases and interviews. And while the police chief or sheriff may be giving the press conference, it's the public information officer who gets the details out, organizes the press meetings, and coordinates the flow of information. He or she may also be the person who's posting to all that social media. Now, sometimes uh, they're called a communications officer or a public affairs officer. The PIOs are usually sworn officers, but as we've discovered here in North Carolina, not always. Uh, at the 40 department websites we looked at, for about half of them, we could find somebody designated as a PIO type individual. And for most of those, we could find a contact information specifically for them. And again, sometimes it's phone number, sometimes it's an email. Uh, if not specifically listed in your local law enforcement um, website, we presume you could call the agency's admin numbers and ask for the public information officer by title and you'll get linked to somebody. Now, some of the larger departments also had community support or community resource or community outreach officers with a wide range of duties related to building relationships between their departments and the community. If you're not sure who to talk to, I would call the public information officer first. They will direct you to the right person. All right. I think this helps us start communicating with our local agencies when we have comments or if we have questions or we want to set up a meeting. But what if we feel like we have a complaint? That brings us to our next survey question. So, we, yes, we asked, uh, did, you know, do you know about your citizen complaint process if you have one? And we're glad to see that there weren't any outright no answers to this question. Although it looks like a lot of people don't know what kind of process may be in place for the department. So this is an area where we may find some differences between principle and practice. While there's probably a way to make your complaint known, whether you can get it satisfactory, sat satisfactorily resolved or not may be another story. And we're going to talk about that more in the next program. Next slide, if you can get it working. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in one of our other programs. This is actually the third Thursday in November. We're going to be talking about oversight. So we'll be talking more about that complaint process and what happens happens there. Um, we'll be talking at that, in that program. We'll be talking about the internal investigation procedures that are conducted by the professional standards divisions in many agencies, and we also want to look at communities that have external mechanisms in place for input like a citizen review board or a sheriff's round table. And, and we did note when we were looking at the department websites that there were a lot that had online forms that you could fill out for a complaint. And if they didn't have an online form, then they also they had text explaining exactly where you need to go to file your complaint or who you needed to talk to. And um, on several of those online forms, there were also forms to commend officers as well as to complain about an office. So next slide, please. So our next subject for our, our, our survey that we took before this meeting uh, was talking about budgets. And we, uh, just to show you how little I knew about budgets of law enforcement agencies going into this, I was formulating the answers for the survey and I picked some really no, low numbers. There, there was not a department budget we found that wasn't millions, millions of dollars. So it was just kind of, shows my ignorance of the subject starting out that I, that I thought, well, you know, I'm just picking some numbers and, and they were very low. Um, budgets, of course, are pretty complex subjects and um, trying to get good numbers uh, for the 40 departments wasn't easy. So we uh, looked at a small representative of departments, about 10 of them. And we found numbers ranging for about $3 million for a city like Laurenburg, city police, their city police department budget, $3 million to $132 million for a county like Mecklenburg. And the budgets are typically based on the size of the community and the size of the department and also the range of the mission, missions that that department carries out. And while some, we found some departments with personnel, seasonal personnel, 
Um, regardless of the size of the department, the bulk of the budget is in the salaries, the benefits, the insurance, and the retirement for the personnel. And as police budgets are coming under scrutiny, we wanted to talk a little bit about the basic process, the basic budget process. So next slide, please. So we have another poll, Andrea, and we're asking folks about if they've ever attended budget hearings or made public comment at budget hearings. Okay, launching poll, and this is a two question poll. So we're just curious to see if anybody out there has ever attended these. And the results are coming in. So it looks like. Yeah, let's see. That's, I that's think good, right? 50 of 58. That's pretty good. Let me hit end. Oh, wait, someone else just voted. So let me give it a couple more seconds. Okay. 53. Maybe we can get to perfect 58 out of 58. <laughs> Well, I'm not voting. I was so going to say, I guess, yeah. I guess we count. Okay. So, 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 so that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. So we have 36% say yes, 64% say no. And then the second question of that was, have you ever given public comment at one of these? And, and we have 13%. Yes, that's awesome. And 87% uh, no, which I think again, it, it's one of those things a lot of people do not do. I'm glad to see we have some that have. But just to, talking about the, um, the process, go ahead, next slide, please. Um, budgets are submitted by the departments, but approved by our elected officials. Usually that is your city council or your county commissioners. And it usually involves several public meetings. They don't get the budget done in one meeting. And the department heads from all the various departments come through and, and or their representatives, and they um, present their requests to the approving body. And at some point in the process, usually public, comment is accepted. So um, once the budgets are approved, though, that's not necessarily the end of it. Uh, sheriffs and police chiefs often come back to ask the approving body for additional funds for special equipment or special projects. And um, having an active observer corps with your local league is one of the ways you help alert your membership to areas of concern at, at a budget meeting or any other kind of meeting. Um, and for those not familiar, uh, with the process of an observer corps, uh, a lot of local leagues have members who agree to regularly observe public meetings of governmental bodies that they have determined are important for them to be monitoring what's happening. And they observe both the process of how the meetings are conducted, um, is the proper notice for the meeting given, is the agenda available to the public, is the supporting information on the agenda items available to the public, that kind of process. And then they also pay attention to the content of the meeting uh, to see if there are any issues that, that are touched upon that uh, might intersect with league positions that the local league board then may want to weigh in on. So that's the basic process for folks um, to learn about the budget and, and you might, like I said, want to think about what's going on in your community. When that budget process happens, taking a look at what's going on and seeing if there's any areas you do want to make a public comment about. So I think we're on now to the next subject of our elected um, sheriff. So I'm going to turn it over to Martha now. And hopefully her microphone's working better than <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, yes, we've now come to, this was our pre-meeting survey question number seven, asking what is the current salary for your county sheriff? And um, as you can see, um, the vast majority of the respondents just simply didn't know. We had about six people who thought it was between 100 and 175,000. And um, what's interesting is um, we did some research on some, but not all of the 100 North Car Carolina counties, but we did find a wide range um, from a low of about 48,000 in Allegheny County to a high of almost 158,000 for Mecklenburg County. Um, not surprising, the more densely populated larger counties um, can typically afford to pay higher budgets for their sheriffs who assume, generally are assuming greater responsibilities in their position than uh, sheriffs of rural counties. Next slide, please, Sandra. I'm working on it. <laughs> there it is. There's a little delay, sorry, go. Yeah. 
Yeah, what we have up here is a slide of our North Carolina, a section of our North Carolina Constitution. And um, what's interesting is sheriffs in North Carolina hold a very unique position in our local law enforcement world. Um, the sheriff is the only officer of local government that is mandated in the North Carolina Constitution. And that dates back to 1776 and also has a term of office of four years. It used to be two years, and I think in the late 30s, um, uh, they changed it to four years. As you probably know, unlike a police chief, sheriffs are elected. Um, qualifications to run for the office of sheriff are fairly minimal, um, generally just include an age and a county residency requirement, among a few others. However, in 2010, the voters overwhelmingly approved an additional qualification, and that now prohibits anyone who is a convicted felon anywhere from being an elected or appointed sheriff. And um, one last thing to say is, as a constitutional office, it has powers and authority that are not subject to the dictates of a local county governing board, and that was um, a bit enlightening for me. Um, to, to hear that, for example, the, your county commissioners can set the budget for the sheriff department, but how the sheriff, um, in terms of how many numbers of, of deputies he may hire, what salaries he pays, that kind of thing, is left up to, up to the sheriff. Next slide, please. And this gets us to poll question number five. Did you, do you find your sheriff more or less accessible than other another officer. So if we could open up the polling, please. Launching poll. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We'll give it a few more seconds yeah. here. Anybody else want to vote? I think that's it. Okay. All right. Um, before I get into the results, I just want to say that this question was designed to be what I would call a perception question. Um, we were really asking this question to see whether you felt your county sheriff was more or less accessible to you as a county resident or more responsive to you as a county uh, resident or less because she's an elected officer. Or do you think that really makes any difference at all? Um, but anyway, about 11% of you said it makes it more accessible. 37%, um, which was the largest, said no difference. And then less accessible and does not apply came in at a tie at about 26%. So we can go to the next slide. I just, yeah. There we go, thank you. <laughs> um, this brings us to the last pre-meeting survey question, which it asks, as you can see, what is the current starting salary for your average law enforcement officer in North Carolina? And what we meant by that is we were looking at the sheriff's deputy or the police patrol officer. And um, also, as you can see by the slide, the results of the survey included a lot of guesses and a lot of I don't know answers. Um, we discovered in our research that actually the range of starting salaries is fairly narrow. Um, it ranges from about 35000 to 38000 a year, depending on a person's education. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Sandra, who will give us a preview of our September 17th program. And, and, and before you do, I just want to interrupt. I mean, I, I'm, I'm retired law enforcement. Um, this is Ernie Miles speaking from Henderson County. I, I'm retired law enforcement and worked 
with different agencies throughout my career. Uh, and it was interesting to me that the range was so narrow for starting salaries. I mean, from small, very small departments to huge departments and your starting salary was going to be very close. And when you factor in cost of livings, uh, it just, economically, it was very interesting to me. And that, again, that's one of those things we could probably spend a whole topic on, but. Well, we are going to be talking about the hiring process um, on our, that's going to be our next program in September, September 17th, and we we'll hope you join us for that. And um, the topics we'll be, we'll be discussing there, we'll be talking about the North Carolina Criminal Justice Education and Standards Commission and the North Carolina Sheriff's Education and Standards Commission. These are two organizations that we, I didn't know they even existed until we started looking at this. They are the organization that developed the minimum entrance standards for law, all law enforcement officers in the state, among other responsibilities. They also review applications, they review complaints, they do a lot of things. And this is a this is a statewide commission, and we're going to be looking into to who how, who that who they are, what they're who they're made up of, how they get appointed to the commission, and the work of the commission. Because like I said, they have quite a few responsibilities. And then in that program in September, we'll also be talking with some department representatives about their recruiting efforts and their hiring processes. Next slide, please. And so one last thing we wanted to mention this evening is about the um, recently formed Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice being co-chaired by Attorney General Josh Stein and Associate Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, Anita Earl. Uh, it's been, they just, can, they just, Governor just, put this task force together in June, I believe, and they have been meeting. Uh, the task force has four working groups, law enforcement management, policing policy and practices, court-based interventions to end discriminatory criminalization, and advanced racial equity in trials and post-conviction. So there's basically two working groups that are working on policing issues and two working groups that are working on the court issues. And um, I don't know if Andrea has the, um, web address for that for this website. She can drop it in the chat box and she can go directly to that website and take a look at it. Um, but we just wanted to let you know about this happening because they are having meetings constantly, looks like, and they also were having public comment sessions. And there's a couple of those scheduled coming up and you can sign up for public comment on their website. And I, I just as a, a note of interest, I sat in today, uh, the working group had a meeting this morning, working group one, and um, I, I think I got into it a few minutes late, so I'm not sure exactly who all the members were on there, but a couple of the members of, the, of this working group uh, were Sheriff John Ingram of Brunswick County, Chief of Police DJ Davis of Durham, and Mayor Mitch Coleman of Fayetteville. And they were, today, they were talking about recruiting and retention, and their next two meetings they talked about the topics that were coming up for the next two meetings on um, September 17th. They're going to be talking about training, and on 10 1, they're going to be talking about accountability culture. So it struck me as they were talking about these things that were coming up that how, how much what they're talking about and what we're talking about, how they're paralleling each other. We developed these programs independently of knowing what they were going to be talking about, and we're, and we're looking at exactly those same issues. Our next program is hiring which includes recruiting. October, we're going to be looking at training. In November, we're going to be looking at oversight. So our working group seems to be looking at the exact same issues through a community lens. All right, so next slide. I think we're to the, getting in, to the end here. I think we're, we're looking for a little feedback. Uh, we hope we've given you some helpful information and some food for thought. Um, and we didn't, like I said, we didn't want to take a lot of time tonight to do a formal question and answer session, as Andrea told you at the beginning, because for two reasons, we know some of you are probably anxious to get back to your convention coverage tonight. And also, if you have questions about policing procedures, we, right now we probably don't know the answer to that. But Andrea has been monitoring the chat this evening, and if there is anything in there, Andrea, that you see that we could answer, if it has something to do with league process or questions about the working group or questions about anything like I said that we could actually answer. Uh, we could take yeah. a few minutes to address those right now. 
Yeah. So um, I know at the part where we were talking about pay, um, Anne said, do the entry level officers get overtime pay? Don't know the answer. Do you? So I, I'm, I'm going to speculate here. I, I know this for a fact, but only for Hendersonville police and Henderson County, just because I've talked to them um, during their training phase up to and including field training officer. The answer is no. But once they are fully certified and fully vetted um, through both the state and the local agency and they've, they've gone through their probationary period, uh, I believe overtime is available, yes. Sorry, I'm answering something in the chat. Everyone's very complimentary of all this great work and research and they're saying it's a great place to get started. Um, I'm scrolling back up. I know um, we were talking about pay. Phoebe said this is definitely not enough money for anyone living in a high cost area like Asheville. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel Poller said our starting salaries based on state figures like with teachers. That's a good question. Don't know. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Yeah, we're hoping, like they were hoping that if you do have specific questions about topics that you know we'll be covering in the next three programs, that you have entered them into the check, chat box or you will before you go because we will be reviewing the questions and we'll hope to incorporate the answers into the future programs when we find out what the answers are. Because again, we're, we're, on, we're, fact, we're in fact finding mode and, um, mm -hmm. and we're also, um, I'll do a plug for our working group uh, right now we've got about six members uh, from maybe three, four leagues. And um, if there are any league members out there who want to join our policing policies working group, please email us at this email you see on your screen and uh, let us know your interest because we would welcome your input. Welcome to have you be a part of our, our group as we um, find, find out uh, what the state of policing is here in North Carolina. Anything else, Andrea, you got in the chat box you want to? Well, there are some things, but I actually, let me go back to this comment by Joanne, because I think it could help um, everybody with next steps. Can I get rid of this now? I just I have know. to find it. Yeah, I think you could stop screen sharing. Can I stop sharing? You can all see everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Oh, and now I lost my chat box. I'll find it. <laughs> and we're um, back. And you're back. Hello. All right. And we do encourage, I am going to send, I, I'll use this time to say, I'm going to send a follow-up email tonight, actually, um, that will give you that link for September 17th. Go ahead and sign up, save the date for that. Um, it's going to also, uh, we're going to send out an Excel file. Sandra, do you want to talk about that? What's in that one? Sure. I, you know, we, and we know everybody doesn't have Excel, but we couldn't find a good way to save it any other way. But it, 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 it's going to include in it the research for all the departments we looked at. It's going to have direct links for their website, their Facebook pages, and their Twitter feeds for you. So you don't have to go look that up. If you, if you have Excel you wanna, and you want to follow more than just your local departments, um, you can look at some of the other areas in the state if you want to follow, uh, you know, get on their Facebook pages and their Twitter feeds. Um, and again, we think, it's a, we think it's a good place to start if you're not already monitoring those forms of communication. It's a good place to, to begin. Yeah. So Joanne Blyther um, said she's not on social media, but I do work with my community watch and county community group. We have good police presence with police and fire department, other agencies at meeting often use police house checks when out of town. I do check city and county websites for info from time to time. The virus has prevented meetings, but we do have a community watch email group with police contact on it as well. And we get monthly police reports for our area. So, and Joanne, if you're still on, if you want to tell us where you are, because I'm not sure the geography of that, but that's cool. I'm in yeah. Fayetteville, North Carolina. That's Cumberland County. Yeah. Yay, Fayetteville. <laughs> relationships there. Nice. Good. So I think we've about, yeah, we've about covered what we know. We like to say we are going to delve into these other three topics in, over the next three months, and we hope that you will join us for that. And, we, and we're we're happy you joined us tonight because I know everybody's time is limited for these kind of things, and we appreciate your attention. And again, if you're interested in um, in, in getting involved with us, uh, we're happy to have you, and we will be having that meeting again in December for league members to discuss, do we, is there, is this something we want to pursue 
at convention next year. You got anything else, Martha? No, just thank, thank you guys and thank everyone for participating tonight. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Andrew. Good night.